Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Dr. Richard Harrington, the head of Earth Sciences at the Natural History Museum in London. Yep. Um, we're of course reporting uh, from COP26. Um, right now we're in the New York Times Climate Hub, actually in the Nature Bar, which I understand is uh, sponsored by the Natural History Museum. Well, we were partnering uh, with, with a force for nature um, sessions in the last three days here, yeah. Right. So, uh, together with the New York Times. Right. It's been a really, yeah, really productive three days. So similar to a recent podcast you were on, uh, uh, the, the um, Robert Bryce's uh, Power mm -hmm. Hungry podcast, we do like our guests to give us a kind of brief uh, uh, self-introduction. So right. if you could take that away for, for us, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, great. Well, I, you know, I trained, I'm trained as an economic geologist and um, my area has been economic minerals since I graduated. I, I, I had a time in industry, so I worked at the front end of, you know, looking for useful minerals that mm -hmm. uh, as part of an organization. Um, but then I, I, I came back into doing, I, I realized I was really interested in the science of, and focused back more. So I've been at the Natural History Museum for the last 29 years, actually building a research group that are looking okay. at investigating minerals and obviously now I've got a bigger brief but still very focused on looking at So is that similar to being an academic geologist? Is it like a kind of a university appointment? Yeah, or is it, it is. So I'm visiting professor at a couple of universities too. So I do, I teach undergraduates. I have research students and postdocs. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So yeah, we have an active group and we obviously are you know, constantly working with, with undergraduates and Excellent. graduates. Yeah. Yeah. So I had, um, you know, I've been very interested in kind of how the sausage gets made in terms of the mining sector because, right. you know, living in the West, um, we're so far removed, I mm -hmm. think, almost everywhere yeah. um, from this uh, side of our, our, really our lifestyle and, you know, everything that's not grown from the, the, the ground or harvested from an animal um, is, is, is mined. Um, and that's such an obvious truism, and yet um, there's, there's so little kind of that percolates mm -hmm. into the popular consciousness other than maybe seeing you know, images of huge mining trucks, you know, sure. maybe in the context of a, of a climate sure. conference. Sure. Um, well, you know, I think that is, that is something that we, uh, I'm very conscious of, is that the, the public have lost that connect between the products they use and where we get them from. I think agriculture, you know, food, the food uh, industry has done quite a good job now we, of, of uh, actually educating people as to where the, the, the food they eat comes from. And I think people have, have got very concerned about where their food comes from. They want to know if it's the farming methods are mm -hmm. good, whether they're being flown all the way around the world. But we're not in that situation for metals, you know. If we look at the Europe, United Kingdom, we were built on metals back in the Industrial Revolution, where mining, you know, everybody knew mining, uh, the materials went to a factory and we made products. I think people have, for have forgotten that. Now, they, they've forgotten that actually mining still goes on and mm -hmm. that all those things, as you say, that we don't grow, have to come out of the ground, have to be mines. It's just that the mines aren't in Europe right. and people have lost we that connection between we the product mm -hmm. and what's needed to, to make that product. Yeah, it seems like in much of the West, maybe Canada is a bit of an exception to this, um, but the mining has largely been offshore. I know in the States, it's a huge regulatory process to get a yeah. mine approved, and so yeah. that really leads to a, kind of a moratorium on mining also, mm. almost. You know, it's very interesting. We're uh, reporting here in Glasgow. Um, I was uh, one of the climate marches the other day and uh, saw the statue to James Watt, right. um, who's obviously a giant, um, of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, I guess he finessed the Newcomen uh, steam engine. Yeah. But it was it's interesting to me because uh, I was just realizing that the early steam engines, their role was to facilitate Abs coal mining, right? Well, so, a, a metal mining in total. So the mm. Cornish tin mines, so in, were, you know, Watt's engine, patented right. engine, was the reason that mines were able to go deep. So not right. only for coal, so yeah, absolutely right. You know, pumping water out of a coal mine uh, before you'd have to dig a tunnel to try and get the water to flow out. Right. But you could actually go then below the water table with a mine. Right. With with that, yes. Yeah, so that that was one of those game-changing technologies yeah. that that revolution. And it's mine. it's it's so complementary and tied together that you know yep. this new energy dense fuel. In, unleashes the industrial revolution, but it creates a machine to sure. sort of uh, enable it. I just I thought that was kind of an interesting yeah. bit yeah. of I don't know almost poetry to all that. Um, all right, so uh, you know, as we were saying, uh, this kind of uh, anti-extractivism ideology. Mm -hmm. um, 
I want to explore that a little bit more. Um, but first, let's let's kind of dive into um, like a bit of a history of mining. And mm -hmm. I thought the way to structure this might be, you know, we just talked about the Industrial Revolution, but talking through, um, you know, even hunter gatherers sure. harvested things. But then, you know, moving through the Iron Age, um, mm -hmm. and even into a aviation and, and kind of present day electronics. That's a too big of a question, but, <laughs> no, no, but let's it, see what we can move through okay, here. Okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's tweak a bit because obviously, development humans. Uh, through, throughout uh, the, the time we've been on the planet has been punctuated by changes in the way we, we live and work. And, and, and materials are part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you obviously you hear about the Stone Age, the Neolithic, when, oh, uh, and the Mesolithic. So these are periods when the hunter-gatherers recognized that they could make a better weapon, mm -hmm. you know, not just a sharpened stick, which was grown for wood, if they got a piece of flint or something and sharpened right. it. And then that opened commodity, so those flints would only come from certain areas of the planet. Right. And then people would start to trade them. And they, I'm, I'm assuming, became quite wealthy, trading those flints to the hunters and right. gatherers. Right. Um, and straight away, you start the mining business. So they, uh, but we went quite rapidly, you know. So early on, we probably only used a few commodities. We used as of flint, and then we used wood and so on, built right. houses. But then, of course, we discovered metals and, and how to make metals. So there was the Bronze Age, discovering right. copper. You could make metals that you could work easily. And then iron, and, and then obviously the Iron Age and that right. revolution. And, but we started escalating our use of metals around the time of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So we went from perhaps using five metals. Uh, what were those? Well, they'd be, they'd be iron, and right. copper, you know, brass and bronze and you know, a bit of lead and zinc. But then right. we started to make them more sophisticated products like motor vehicles. And we recognized we, we could use aluminium for parts to make them right. lighter. Mm -hmm. And we needed lots of copper for, the wi for wiring and, and uh, you know, other, other metals that had specific use. Hardening the steel, for example, right. you know, putting titanium into steel and so on. Mm -hmm. And so by the end, you know, we, we soon escalated to the point uh, and every time we've changed our technology, you know, for, for oil generation, gas turbines, electric motors, we, they needed more elements. New, new right. metals were coming right. into each of those technology revolutions. And of course now we're at the amazing point of needing all this renewable energy and a range of different ways of generating our power. Mm -hmm. And it needs a bigger use so that we're, we're probably up to about 70 elements right. from the periodic like in, table. I, I've heard in the iPhone there's like half the periodic table almost. There is, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there is. Because each of those metals imbues a different property. So there's, you know, there's things like indium going in the touch screen. It's a metal probably a lot of people haven't heard, right. even heard of. Right. But it, it's the reason you can touch it and, you know. And so these are properties of, I mean, obviously I can think mm. in my <laughs> very basic way about this, you know, why we entered the Iron Age, why that had the mm. implications it did, what a useful metal it is. I think yeah. iron ore is still 70% of all. It's that's yeah. of everything that's mined yeah. is still iron because yes. it's bloody useful and yeah. Vatslav's mill who I bring up every podcast basically talks about just how you know the the steel is what's used to make everything else in terms of all the machines it, it, it is I mean those there are primary metals that underpin you know maybe 70 percent of the activity so it is your iron it, it's 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 copper aluminium right so there's sort of three biggies big, big, biggies obviously there's industrial minerals as well, so they're, they're mine, you know, like cement. You know. mm -hmm. Just think of how much of that we use. Um, and then others like, you know, zinc and, and nickel we hear about, right. and, and some of those metals. But, the, but iron, copper, a, a, a big business. We don't talk about gold, but, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. gold's actually not very useful generally, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's, it's looked upon as a, you know, the, 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 where net wealth is, is held. So. Right. That's, that's an unusual metal. There's a lot of effort goes into mining gold, mm -hmm. something that's not particularly useful. To right. Yeah. right, right, right. So in a very basic way, and I know mm -hmm. each of these you know, elements probably have very different processes mm -hmm. involved in them, but you know, for my own education as someone who's quite ignorant on this, what are the kind of basic stages? You mentioned you were in probably prospecting the front end, yeah, yeah. but what walk me through? You know, like maybe just the prospecting part, but into the mine, you right. know, m milling, I guess, yeah. like how you purify these things sure. into something useful. And I think we can then talk about you know what the environmental and, and human sociological impacts are. Yeah, absolutely. So 
yeah, obviously the, the, the metals are found in the natural environment in uh, areas where they've become concentrated by, by geological processes. So yeah. being a geologist, you sort of understand how the earth can, can concentrate those metals into particular places. Uh -huh. But you know, they're, they're very rarely delivered as the metal. Right. It's usually as a compound. So, for example, the iron, it's, uh, it's iron oxide we, we, we mine. It's, mm -hmm. so it's basically iron combined with oxygen. Right. Uh, and it's very common minerals, things like something called hematite, which is an iron oxide. And uh, so... And we see that, like, that's that kind of rusty looking yeah, rock that you... Yeah, so, you know, you, you see, people might have heard of things called banded iron formations. Yes, okay. They, they formed at particular parts of the Earth's geological history where massive accumulations of iron were, com you know, combined with oxygen were, were laid down. It had something to do with the great oxygenation event? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of James Lovelock, and yeah. I don't know how this ties into the whole Gaia hypothesis, okay. but... But I guess that unleashing of oxygen mm -hmm. um, is what led to these these yep. uh, bandied iron formations. Absolutely. The, so the, the fo actually these mega early photosynthesizers, I guess, right? Exactly right. So yeah. cyanobacteria that were photosynthesizing up to the oxygen levels of the atmosphere back right. in early time. It, this is when life just emerged. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it did was change the chemistry of the oceans right. so that all this iron that was previously dissolved uh, you know, right. as a salt in the, in the ocean suddenly became oxidized mm -hmm. and then formed these layers. So that was a geological event. There. So pretty much the majority of the iron ore we, we eat today comes from those types of deposits. Wow. Um, but you can begin to see there's a problem. We've got iron as an oxide. Right. We want iron as the element. We need to take a lot of oxygen out of the rock. Okay, this is a crazy thing. I was in a, like a university lecture hall and this professor said, you know, what, what are these walls made out of predominantly? Mm -hmm. And uh, cement. Well, what was that made out of? Yeah. The wall is predominantly oxygen. The, yeah. I forget the name of the, uh, the it's not a molecule, but the... It's, it's a, yeah, it's a calcium it's, silicate, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, silicon and then a couple oxygens. And, and a bit of calcium. Right. Mm -hmm. And because where oxygen sits on the periodic table, it's by atomic mass, it's... So the, the cement wall is mostly oxygen, it's, which we're so used to it as a gas, it, it's just mind-boggling yeah, to, to yeah. think about that. No, it, it, it is. And, you know, and there's, a, there's an inbuilt problem in that because the... The, the cement is calcium silicate, mm -hmm. more or less, um, but the, the raw material for cement is limestone, which is calcium carbonate. Right. And there's not a lot of carbonate in, in that. So you, a lot of that, when they process the limestone right. to make cement, the, the carbon and the oxygen, part of it, come out. Yeah. So that's where you know, cement making makes a lot of carbon dioxide. Right. And the iron ore is the same. You know, if we try and get the oxygen out of the iron, the way we do it currently right. is to use metallurgical coal. Yes, okay. And so that's creating the you know, carbon dioxide, and you end up with the metal. So you can see that, that we need those raw materials, but, but actually making those from what nature deals up as the, the ore mm -hmm. can sometimes give you those, those kind of issues. Other, other metals are there as different compounds, so things like copper. A lot of it is coming from sulfides, so mm -hmm. we, it, you know, it's a different chemical combination. Mm -hmm. But we still have to break that apart, processing right. to get that metal out. Okay, so we've got sort of prospecting, yeah. um, and you talked about the way these deposits are formed amongst people that are interested in mm. nuclear energy. We love the Oklo uh, story, the Oklo oh, yeah, reactor natural, in Gabon. Oh, yeah, a natural reactor. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a natural, yeah. fully natural process, right. like nuclear right. fission. Yeah. yeah, so that's very interesting. Mm. Um, Okay, so again, we've, we've, we've hit up the prospecting, the, the mining, I mm -hmm. guess like the milling. You know, there's obviously some processes that are far more toxic than others. Sure. Um, I think about, I think gold in particular, a lot of arsenic. Yeah. Um, Can like, be, yes, exactly. So are there certain minerals that are just dirty and nasty and there's really no way to uh, make a nice sausage or? No, but I think that's one of the things that's quite inspiring. And I, my research group work in that area is to try and find more benign technologies. Right. So one of the things that we've worked on a lot is, can we do things at lower temperature, so therefore you, know, you don't have to use lots of energy, and can you use actually natural solutions? Can you use, for example, we use bacteria that can work mm. in with toxic minerals and turn them into compounds that are more stable. And right, less bioavailable. And yeah, less bioavailable, mm -hmm. exactly. So I think there are, I mean, 
Are, are there it, scalable success stories of that? Or like, cause I find in the media you hear a lot of sort of yeah. fringe cases, hey, we found this new process, but it's not scalable. But the media jumps on it, and, and it's, it's exciting, and it's cool sure. science, but like, these processes you're talking about, are, are they scalable? Yeah, well, the bu bugs are actually used to get about 30% of the copper we recover wow. from mines. Yeah. We're using bugs because they... Uh, microbes. Microbes. Right. Okay, yeah. exactly. <laughs> just yeah. to be yeah. clear. No, no, absolutely. These are microscopic. Yeah. They, they actually help to break the minerals down, and they mm -hmm. do that in, the, in, in, in acidic conditions right. um, because they're using the energy from the chemical reaction. And, and it is. A, it's, a, it's actually at an industrial scale. And uh, so some of these are. There mm -hmm. are lots of them that are just pilot scale. Right. And your, your alternative is using what exactly for the copper? Like, and I'm wondering, is that 30% like on the way up to 80, 90%? Or, and what is the alternative to this kind of bioreactor you're, you're right. discussing? Well, that, I mean, it works for some, that's where you have to look at the, the type of the minerals that's got that the metals in, because some are uh, able to be processed and there are others that can't. So that's part of what my group do. We, we, we try to look at the, the, the complexity and, and make them, um, one of the other things is we're looking at materials that have been discarded in the past for being waste. Mm, right. Uh, and it could be that with new biotechnologies, that waste could be turned into something that we could recover. Right. So it, it's, um, if, if you like, there are, there, there are a lot of new technologies that could, could be applied. Um, some we know have been scaled up industrially, but others are you know, still at the sort of pilot scale. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you know, uh, the kind of school of environmentalism that I'm, mm -hmm. I guess, have my toes in, or a little more than sure. my toes, is, is this eco-modernism and this idea of um, intensification, right? And so, find the best farmland, learn ways to su sustainably farm it intensively so we can spare more of nature. Um, you know, Canada is very interesting. We have uh, uranium deposits in uh, northern Saskatchewan and Dene territory. Uh, the ore grade is something like 20%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did the, the rough calculations, and uh, full disclosure, I'm not the best at back of the envelopes, but it looks like um, about, you know, these, these a few mines that, you know, are described as being the size of postage stamps from the sky or whatever produce almost 1% of global primary energy sure. because they, they power so much of the world's nuclear fleet. Yeah. Um, so ore grade obviously mm -hmm. is going to have an impact on the, in, like, in terms of the decoupling as much as possible yeah. of, you know, the, the getting minerals from its environmental impact. I think that's a big worry is, you know, we get the easy deposits and then we, we get into lower ore grades and bigger impacts. Yeah. Is that, you know, at the same time, every time we think we're kind of peaking out on something and the price goes up, we find more of it. Like, what's, what's your sense in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, in my view, we're not going to run out because, as mm -hmm. you say, we, we, we can find deposits. There's enough metal in the rock. It's just the cost of getting it out. Mm -hmm. And the cost isn't just economics. It's obviously, you know, could, can you scale the operation, you know, Maybe you could find a deposit that's very, very low grade, mm -hmm. but it just might be, you know, creating too much of an impact that you couldn't couldn't mine it. But no, we're not going to run out. So I think that's um, uh, that's the first thing to say. But you raise a really interesting point because there are two ways of looking at deposits. That you know, historically, the mine grades were very high. So the cop, so let's say a copper mine, mm -hmm. it might have had a copper percentage of more than three, four percent. Mm -hmm. Now we've got these big mines like the ones in, you know, southwest US or, or, or you know, in BC, mm -hmm. down in Chile, where they're mining copper that's only 0.6% of the rock. Mm. So see, 99.4% of the rock is waste. Mm. So that's an incredible amount of rock you have to move to get the copper out. And, and presumably bust up with energy, with yes, fossil fuels. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, that's another big like challenge. How, how small do you have to grind this, this stone to well, put those know, microbes it, on it? And you know, well, for, for actually for bio leaching, it's probably it's not you, you know you have to test it, but right. less grinding. But for for the recovery, the, the current recovery of grinding the rock and, and getting the uh, getting the metals, they have to separate them. The calculation is that between sort of four and eight percent of the world's energy is used just breaking rock. Wow. So it's big. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, agriculture and and and, sure. and, uh, and fashion actually are very similar. You know, in fact, fashion uses a heck of a lot of energy. Yeah. But nevertheless, that's a lot of energy, and it's it's a big driver to try and break and stop that. So right. the thing is, if you could find deposits that have very much higher grade, so if it was six percent copper, yeah, 
immediately then you have to you don't have to mi- you only have to mine a tenth of the rock right, right. Um, so there's two ways you know you can have a uh, a high grade, low impact mine, like those Canadian uh, right. uranium mines you talked about. Yeah. They're quite small and they're producing quite a bit of the world's uh, uranium. Um, but you know, with some of these commodities like copper, we have to mine the really big, low grade uh, deposits to, to fuel the demand that this, right. particularly the Green Revolution is having on us. You know? Yeah, so maybe let's move along to that. Um, mm. One of the thinkers that I follow, uh, Mark P. Mills, he talks a lot about how we're transitioning from a kind of liquids and gases based Mm -hmm. energy system to a mineral based one. Um, And that has huge implications for how do you move the stuff? You know, pipelines are quite an efficient way. Uh, Tankers are quite an efficient way. But I think also people don't think about um, coal and people are, you know, get their head around the fact that it's mine, but you know, Mm -hmm. you can very much look at you know, drilling for petroleum as a source of mining, and because of the you know incredible energy density um, and portability mm-hmm. and everything mm-hmm. of of oil, when you start thinking about replacing that with yeah. a different energy yep. system, um, especially if it's you know windmills and, and mm-hmm. solar panels, um, that's that's a major transition and has huge implications um, for what that mining looks like. Rather than you know drilling a, a hole in the ground, it's so, and, and I understand as well that, you know, the, the kind of renewables transition, I've heard quotes that it will, you know, increase global mining by two, three hundred percent. What, like, what are, what's your sense of, of okay. the implications of a, of a transition to a kind of mostly wind and solar, if that's possible, and yeah. batteries-based yeah. energy system? Sure. Well, we can look at, there's been an IEA, IEA report, so that's the International you know, Energy Authority. So it's a, an international panel who've looked into this. Um, and... Absolutely, there's an increase in the, the amount of energy because, as you say, you're going into more distributed networks of power generation. Mm-hmm. So, let's just give you an example. Each wind turbine's probably got 4,000 tons of steel in it. Right. So you've got to build a lot of those. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you have a coal-fired power station, it would be a small industrial unit mm-hmm. where very focused uh, infrastructure with a with a power line out, but you build. A distributed network of wind turbines offshore right. that's all got to be connected by copper and aluminium uh, there's some you know concrete to build the bases um, there's a huge investment in, in materials and so you know estimates are varied but uh, we know that things like copper have got to go up seven eight ten percent same for aluminium because mm-hmm. we're just going to use more metal to make the wiring mm-hmm. to transmit that electricity and then with you know steel and, and, and cement, that's that's also going to have a, mm-hmm. an increase. And so there's there's a, been a lot of work that that shows absolutely yeah. there will be increases. Now they're major metals, mm-hmm. so you know the aluminium increase is something like 120 million tons a year more. And very so energy small, very energy intensive to make aluminium and electricity intensive it, particularly. It, it, exactly. Right? So it's a bit of a conundrum because we need then more energy to process. And we better make sure that the energy to process is also uh, low carbon. Forty-eight percent of the world's energy is crushing uh, yeah, rocks, right? Yes, like, exactly. So hard to imagine. It's, so it, it's a big challenge, but mm-hmm. we, we know it, we know we can do it in each of those areas. And it's you know the worry is we've got to implement that right. fairly rapidly. Right. I think you know one of I'm, I'm here in COP with a probably sixty-person strong delegation of uh, nuclear energy advocates that yep. are trying to put nuclear energy on on the agenda as a keystone yep. transition technology. And you know, and this podcast is called Decouple. The, the the graphic art on the front is a Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. Sure. Uh, but it's very much I think part of the logic of that um, mm-hmm. beyond emissions and everything is environmental impact. Um, and this idea that you know if you don't need to build an enormous new transmission system, you're saving mm-hmm. yourself a lot of copper and aluminum. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can, you know, build like the the power plant near my city, the nuclear power plant is, you know, on a on a piece of land the size of a s- smallish shopping center. Um, so I think that's that's a, a big kind of rationale in terms of um, sparing resources. But let's, you know, uranium mining is is a controversial topic. Sure. Can you talk us through sort of, um, you know, I guess the historical stuff and sort of what what's happening now? Um, maybe briefly, because we have touched on this previously in another episode. But yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that was an executive of the mining company, so maybe we'll get yeah, a more no, objective. Yeah, no, exactly. Take. Look, it it is con- rather controversial to talk about nuclear energy, um, but you know, my feeling is, as a, as a scientist, um, we should be. You know, you're you're on a you're on a ship that's sinking, mm-hmm. and uh, you look around for life belt or a lifeboat mm-hmm. um, 
we'd be stupid not to consider every type of life belt before we right. go down. Right. It would be silly of us to say, we're never going to use that one because we don't like that life mm -hmm. belt. Mm -hmm. So I look at this as we're in, a, we're in a very challenging situation where we've got to, we've got to get to uh, net zero mm -hmm. and, and we've got to have a planet where we have nature positive activities. So doing all of that, we should be considering all the possible things there. Mm -hmm. So in my view, nuclear energy still should be looked at. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not an advocate for it, but mm. what I would say is that as a scientist, I'm open to, to, to seeing the, uh, right. the, we know that there have been power plants in the UK. You know, we, we currently have 10% of our energy is nuclear power. And our government are pledged that that will still form quite a, uh, a backbone. Mm -hmm. and, and there are, as you pointed out, real positive reasons to do that because it doesn't matter if the sun's shining or the, or the, wind, the wind's blowing, the nuclear power station will, will generate power. Mm -hmm. Then there's obviously then there's the issue of you have to mine the uranium, mm -hmm. you have uh, uh, nuclear waste disposal, um, and that's what we have, you know, we should be considering those in light of all the other impacts. Now, again, I'm not an, I'm not an advocate of nuclear power, but I'm an, I, w I am an advocate against coal mining, because yeah. we know coal mining has killed thousands of people, you know, and particulates in the air from coal power stations has affected lots of populations. And they're things that nuclear power uh, has, you know, it hasn't demonstrably done that kind mm -hmm. of damage. So we should be using some of those, in, you know, when we make those kind of decisions, let's look at the pros and the cons of both the, uh, both the scenarios mm -hmm. before we throw one out. So on, on the waste front, um, obviously that's a huge conversational topic that comes up. What about the waste, right? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that sort of set me most at ease um, <clears throat> was actually speaking with a geologist. Um, you know, there's a whole number of man-made or engineered barriers, you know, when they're talking about burying these kind of capsules underground. But the, the most interesting one was a geological tidbit of information, which was, you know, the rock formation that we're looking at locally in Ontario um, is, a, is a, I think it's kind of limestone. It's about 600 meters deep well below the water table and this particular stone um, it's not very porous so it takes a million years for water to move a meter when I heard that it was hard to believe um, but as a geologist that does that make sense do we do we have a good well characterized understanding of what these rocks are like and and th their behaviors like is that something that's predictable is it knowable um, it, well, it, it certainly is with, with, with scientific uh, evidence and, you know, in Britain we've gone through the same process of looking at where we might have nuclear repositories. And, you know, every rock scenario is, is different. And mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know the Ontario scenario, I'll be, be honest with right, you. Right. But we know that in Sweden they're, they're putting their uh, nuclear waste repositories into crystalline rocks and, right. uh, you know, they're, they're quite comfortable that it and it's been, it's been permitted, it's, they feel quite comfortable that it, that it is a, a potential scenario. No, we know in some crystalline rocks, you know, fluid migration is, is, is pretty slow. And it mm. is, you know, it's like it needs to be tested with science and it sounds like that's what's been, uh, been, been done in Ontario. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that we can test that and we can, use, we can then assess as to whether we feel aquifers will get would get damaged by it or not. Right, right. So let's actually move into another topic, this question of batteries. And, yeah. and the uh, cutting edge battery technology for now is uh, lithium ion based. Mm -hmm. I believe the 2019 uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was handed out for that. Um, takes a while to sort of, from the discovery of the chemistry to the, the first kind of commercial models to wide scale deployment. Um, I spent some time in the Andes um, in uh, Chile, Peru, and Bolivia yeah. uh, several years ago, and a lot of controversy around the lithium mining. Yes. Um, Tell me the dirt on lithium mining. <laughs> well, the dirt on lithium mining. Well, uh, you know, obviously lithium was a was a metal that we didn't really need. Uh, we used it in we use it in medic medication, but it's only recently with the you know the advent, as you said, of a lithium ion battery that suddenly realised that this is a, a phenomenally good way to store energy mm -hmm. in a in a, in, a, in a lightweight uh, battery. Um, so of course, it's where is lithium found? Uh, and one of the obvious places, lithium is a very mobile iron. Right. It, it dissolves in salt water pretty right. well. Right. So we find it in these brines that are in, in like South America. Um, but also we find it in, in rocks. So the, there's about 30% of the world's lithium comes from these brines in, 
right. South America, in the Altiplano districts, yeah, yeah. 30% from, from rocks. Um, but you know, there are big issues with taking it out of uh, those, uh, those brines in the Altiplano, because these are very arid environments. You're using a lot of water. Mm -hmm. So then there's a, there's a big issue there as to can we, ex the current operations seem to be okay, it's su sustainable to a degree, and, but expanding those could be a real issue. So mm -hmm. then we've got that problem that we've got an escalating need for, for lithium, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's probably going to be very um, unwise to, uh, to expand that in, in those areas because you are going to affect water supplies, could well have effects on, on biodiversity. Right. So actually what we, we need to do is look for a diverse source for, for lithium. So one of the things that my group are doing is looking at you know new sources of where lithium might come from. So right. we shouldn't just get focused on getting our supplies from, from one or two sites because right. then we end up, um, if we have a problem, like suddenly we can't get our lithium from the, the, the desert, then we won't be able to build the batteries we need. Yeah. So we've been looking at places like Southwest England, Cornwall, wow. old, old mining districts that have good potential for lithium, uh, and then other areas in uh, you know Western US and potentially in uh, another project we're working on is in Serbia, uh, where um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a new lithium resource being discovered there, completely new, known to science and discovered by geologists. Mm. And it just goes to show that there's, there are still new things to be found and, 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 and discovered. So lithium is a case in point where we've got a very limited set of choices at the moment for where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure we have uh, a much, much more of a choice so that we can expand production without right. them creating a supply chain issue. Right, right. I mean, it's interesting, the kind of geopolitics of oil and yeah. they call it the black curse in yeah. some places. <clears throat> and in some ways, I mean, there was a, a coup in Bolivia not so long ago and it's hard not to think it's somewhat related to lithium. The Elon Musk famously said, you know, in relation to, to Bolivia, we'll coup whoever we like. I mean, it's uh, it's interesting the way that these uh, these minerals play out geopolitically. Yeah, they do, you know, and I think it's a big concern for the likes of, of, of Tesla. You know, where are they going to source those from? You build a gigafactory, you need to make sure that you have a secure supply chain for the, the batteries you're going to put in the car. Right. And I think that's going to, that's a big challenge we have at the moment. Are we going to, uh, have we got secure supply chains for those metals we need for lithium, mm -hmm. cobalt. That's because that's the technology industry's chosen at the moment. And uh, you pointed to the fact that we, you know, it takes years from discovery to actually get something that people could use and be happy to use. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tesla took a long time to choose their battery chemistry. It's something now that they're happy with, so therefore you scale it up. There's lots of other alternative technologies that, that don't use those metals, mm -hmm. but you know, they're 10 years away from industrializing. So if we need to change the climate by pulling CO2 release out of the transport chain, mm -hmm. we can't wait for that technology. We've got to use what we've got now. Right. So that's, I think that's the reason these metals are, are under great focus. At the and it, like, even in the electric vehicle, the, the, that lithium component is hidden. I mean, uh, there's a thousand pound battery um, in in the undercarriage of the car I guess yeah um, so I mean the yeah I mean it's just extraordinary that the amount and like you don't think about it because I don't know you sure yeah, yeah I, I forget the, how much because it's variable with cars but you know right. you're talking tens of hundreds of kilos right um, yeah and, and the overburden that needs to be removed and the, and the ore grade is has big implications for how much mining there is yes let's let's talk about cobalt quickly mm -hmm. um, why on earth is there, 60% of the world's cobalt in, in that region of, of Congo, or the Democratic Republic, I'm not sure what, yes, which, what the country Democratic is. Democratic Republic of Congo, and, and, and Zambia. Yeah. yeah, and let's talk about you know, why that's problematic. I, again, I mean, yeah. mining can be done well or it can be done um, not yeah. well. So tell, no. me, tell, me about, tell me the dirt on cobalt. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, okay. it just so happens that the, in that part of the world there are these large copper mines, and c cobalt, cobalt is very rarely it's it mined for its own on its own. Right. So cobalt's usually a byproduct. So we've got these big copper mines where cobalt goes along with copper for the ride, you know, it's in, right. it's in that deposit and it's recovered as a byproduct. Just so happens, these are quite rich, so 
they end up being, um, because you're processing all that copper, you can keep the cobalt out as well. So it's quite, it's a nice story because it's kind of, you know, you've got a mine that's producing different, different metals. You've got a two for, two for one. You've yeah. got a two for, yes, exactly. Right. And some of those mines making a really good profit, right. but yes, that, as you probably know, that some of those, particularly in the DRC, there have been some issues of, um, uh, in the supply chain, We've got non-regulated or poorly regulated mining where there is implications that maybe child labour's involved. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that's a big no-no for anybody. You know, mm -hmm. that's, and, and so there have been a number of people in the supply chain very concerned about that. So there are some companies, uh, major European car manufacturers will not source their cobalt from there because they're not sure they can be, that, that mm -hmm. child labour could be excluded. So... That in, gives you a problem, doesn't it, when you've got 70% of your cobalt coming from there. Mm -hmm. So again, um, you should be looking, we should be looking to diversify. Yeah. And we do know that the places, we, we, there are uh, nickel mines currently being worked in, in Greece, for example, where none of the cobalt's recovered because the technology they use is not right. minimal. We could probably get 35% of Europe's cobalt just by changing the way that mine is processing. So. Mm. There's some, there are some easy wins out there to improve things. And then look, again, it's, it's diversifying the supply. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to a super, you want to, you don't want to just soup, shop at one supermarket chain. Mm -hmm. If there was only one supermarket chain, we'd, all get, off it, yeah. we'd all get concerned. And that's what we need, the, you know, for metals, right. we need that. Otherwise, games can be played and, you know, and we wouldn't necessarily be able to deliver that green revolution that we, right. that we come in. It, like in terms of the improvements in like the labor conditions in mines, I mean, is that, that's, that's the history essentially of, of trades unionism. I know the coal miners mm -hmm. were very strong yep. um, in, in the UK um, in particular, but I know you're more on the kind of geology side, yeah. not the sociology side, but in terms of, you know, mining, getting to a level where we feel better about it, um, you know, obviously there's tons of like ESG investing and stuff, but I guess yep. I'm more interested in the, in the, the labor side of things and, um, you know, how that has changed, um, particularly maybe in the UK with coal, for instance, you know, what? Yeah, I mean, it, it, yes, unionism came in because obviously mining practices probably in the past were, were not good. And, and we know that, like in Central Africa, that some of those mining practices haven't been great. And we have seen, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on international companies to, to get their ESG portfolios up to mm -hmm. speed. And there, are, there have been changes. So, you know, they're, they're, the companies are making sure they engage better with, because let's face it, you, the, the people should be benefiting from this. You know, you, we've gone past the stage of, of, of robbing the world's resources to, for the, for, well, <laughs> We, yeah. we should be past we that. Should, we should. Yeah. We should be completely yeah. past that, yes. And then there's the other aspect, actually, that, that you know, my institution are really strongly, uh, is that it's the planet and the people. So it's also impacts on, you know, the biodiversity. Right. And so right. that's, that's another consideration. So no, it's people and the planet mm -hmm. and, and not just the, 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 right. the, the profit from the financial side. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're absolutely right. We... Um, it, it, we, we've seen at COP actually that the people's voice needs to be stronger, indigenous people's voice and so on. And so that should also be changing the way we, we tackle this because mm -hmm. um, the, the, the people who it, this affects, you know, the, they're, they're sort of stakeholders in this whole, right. in this whole uh, situation. They, they need to be more, more involved in the whole thing. Let's, let's pivot to rare earth um, mm -hmm. metals rare yep. earth minerals um so i've been told many times they're not rare is it just that they're really hard to 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 mill to yep. the, the ore grades are incredibly low and what what are some of the implications of that i mean i've, I've seen a lake um in china which yep. is and and it, i understand china is the main producer and maybe that's because they're more willing to put up with the environmental impact so let's let's do, j jump into that a little bit and also like why, why do we need these rare okay. minerals yeah, well, the rare, rare earths, they're not rare. Yes, mm -hmm. you're absolutely correct. They're, they're difficult to recover because there's a bunch of those the so-called lanthanides and they're in a part of the periodic table. So there's, there's a bunch of elements that have very similar chemical properties. Um, but there are some slight differences as you go across the periodic table. So some of them are more useful than others. 
So you might have heard of things like uh, neodymium and dysprosium, and then, yeah. you know they're particularly useful because they are used in batch in, in sorry in, in magnets for electric motors, mm -hmm. and they make very much more powerful uh, magnets than say just the steel. I mean, when you, the simple magnet you might buy might be steel, but now that these ceramic special ceramic magnets are, are rare earth magnets that, that are that are really strong. You know the sort of badges you can put on them. Right. Incredibly powerful magnets. They're rare earth. They've got rare earth dope in them. Mm -hmm. um, and so for electric motors, they make some really. Um, they're not irreplaceable, but they're they're important. So they're in wind turbines. They're in electric vehicles. There are alternatives to that though, and there are some manufacturers, European car manufacturers, that have no rare earths in there. Mm. So they're not essential. So why, the, why are they all produced in China? Like why? Okay, yeah. well let's yeah let's go to the China. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Um, because yeah, historically there've been some really awful uh, stories about the processing there. There was a big Bionobo mine uh, because actually separating each of those individual rare earths one from another is very in energy intensive. Because they're so chemically similar. Chemically is that right? Similar. Okay. So it's quite a it's a very complicated process which is energy intensive. And in the case of uh, the Bionova district, there's you know, uranium, thorium are associated with them, and so you could end up having a real uh, problem with the waste. There are ways of, you know, there are new types of deposits. Again, we've been working on those to find deposits that are not associated with uh, things like uranium, so they're, they're easier to process. Mm -hmm. Ones that are associated with clays, where well, it can be recovered. But also technologists have, just, have, have actually worked on uh, uh, magnet systems that avoid rare earths altogether. Mm. So I think we're seeing there's a change there because technology has, has found uh, different magnets that don't use rare earths. But I mean, if they're common in the earth's crust, why, why is that there's not a, a rare earth industry in the US? Is it just a matter of like the infrastructure and the investment that China's been willing to make? Because yeah. I understand there's huge geopolitical implications to the fact that China controls 90 yep. something percent of of the supply chain. Well, it, you, you, it, is yeah. it because of nimbyism, not in my backyard, we don't like mining think, in general, think, or because rare earth minerals are particularly impactful in terms of their environmental impacts? I think the first thing that, obviously, Chinese industries recognize that for the new technologies, rare earths were going to be important. Right. They also controlled, at the time, the big percentage of the world's known uh, reserves. So. Okay. They cornered the market really, and the, and they and they also have the proprietary processing uh, technologies. So it was complete win for them to, to focus on that because mm -hmm. they they were able to control the market for a, uh, a period of time because right. that puts you in a strong position. US did produce; they have a you know there's a mine that had produced, and there was a refining system. But actually, that the Chinese uh, organisations bought that up, so they had a very aggressive policy right. to, to, to control that. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing now is that there is there are people coming into that market now to try and um, diversify that supply. So right. we've got companies now looking in places in Africa, building refineries maybe in, even in the UK for rare earths mm -hmm. to again diversify that supply right. and then maybe people will go back to using rare earth magnets because they are very very good in right. quality. Right. Right. But yes it, it is China definitely had the monopoly, it still mm -hmm. does, but people are trying to break that. Now. So it's not, an, it's not an issue of the particularly nasty environmental process involved in rare earths? No, I mean, that it's, we, it, it that is energy intensive though. Okay. And, and so people are looking to new deposit types. So we've been looking at rare earths that are bound up with clay, where you can use simple solution uh, extraction technologies, gotcha, gotcha. which are less uh, energy intensive. Yeah, less energy intensive, but also uh, much less environmentally problematic. So I've, I've heard maybe we're kind of wrap, wrapping up soon here, but. Um, uh, I guess one of the kind of new real possibilities is um, this deep sea mining, right. which I've heard you speak yes. about in the past. Yeah. Um, why, why is that of interest? Um, you know, is that potentially kind of revolutionary to mining, or it's just another another place to go after? Is it just bizarre because it's you know four thousand feet under the surface yeah. of the ocean? I mean, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. It's not quite like asteroid mining, but no, it, no, it's, it, no. But it is a completely new frontier. You're absolutely yeah. correct. You know, it's it's like we we we're used to terrestrial mining, but deep ocean mining, we we haven't really. Well, we haven't done. 
Yeah, there's kind of three types of potential metal sources in the deep ocean. Um, you may have heard of these sort of the, the, the metal deposits that form around hydrothermal vents, yeah, getting yeah. in the middle, middle ocean ridges. And so these are the sulfide minerals like copper, zinc, gold, and so on. I mean, I'll be frank, these are probably less attractive targets. Those metals we, we can find in terrestrial mines. But then there's a third type, a uh, second type of deposit, which is uh, a third type, are uh, uh, crusts, these so-called manganese crusts, polymetallic crusts. And then we have the, th this, the third type is the um, uh, man manganese or the polymetallic nodules. So these are probably the ones you, you mean, because the, the, the deep ocean floor and the in Indian Ocean across the Pacific, we've got huge fields of these, you know, maybe 6,000 by 1,000 kilometer wow. area where you have these sort of potato sized nodules of metals that have accumulated. Now, collectively, they contain more than enough cobalt and nickel and copper to fuel that kind of green revolution. But, you know, it's a new frontier. It's, it's, a, you, you, it's mining on the deep ocean floor where we know far less about the, uh, you know, the biodiversity and the uh, environment there. So it's a big decision as to whether that mining should be permitted. And mm -hmm. you know, at the moment, it's, there's a moratorium on it. People are considering it. But there's no doubt, you know, if, if that was the only source, we, we could get our metals from that. And, right. and maybe if people do the, um, you know, all the, the science is done and we compare, uh, it might come down to, are we going to get the metal from this rainforest? <laughs> Or are we going to get this metal from the deep ocean? Right. And then that's a societal choice. You know, I, I, I as a scientist, you, you'd have to have the data there to make that decision. But it, it maybe comes down to that because it is about choice. We know right. we need those metals. Right. And, and maybe everybody says yes, we should get it from mines on land. Um, but we still do have that choice. Of being able to take it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm always of the tendency with these kind of questions about energy and, and resources that it should be sort of goal based. So, you know, what has the, the minimal environmental impact yeah. on biodiversity, mm -hmm. on you yeah. know, water quality, on carbon emissions, etc. You know, mm -hmm. and so but the oceans do have this sort of sacredness around them, like this enshrined in a lot of international law, it seems. Yes. I mean, there yes. was there was questions of seeding the oceans with, I think, iron sulfides to try yes. and draw down CO2 too, but you know there was an experiment actually off the, the west coast of my country, Canada, yes, yeah. um, which I think I think it might have been effective with this uh, this yeah. algal bloom, but but it's it's something that we're very timid to, to get very into. Much. While at the same time we have a pretty low threshold to mine the Congo or other places, I know. Where, where you know you're, you're really having a human impact as well. What, what's your sense if we're to set sort of objective measures again? in terms of like impact on, on humans, first off, but yeah. biodiversity, um, energy use. I mean, are these really attractive? Um, like setting aside the kind of regulations around mm -hmm. doing stuff in the deep sea, uh, for you as a scientist, from what you know about this is, this, is this a potential decoupling in terms of mining or a relative decoupling of getting these resources from their environmental apps? Do you think it's more environmentally friendly? We don't know at the moment. We okay. don't have the data. I mean, right. if, you put the, if you put the sort of social side of it, I mean, effectively, you're not displacing local people. And so some of the proponents of that mining have suggested you've taken the human problem out of, the, 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 of that. Of that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, what we don't know is what the effect is on the biodiversity. Right. Because we don't know, we haven't mapped the biodiversity well enough. Mm -hmm. That is going on at the moment. And actually, mm -hmm. the companies that are seeking to mine there are funding that kind of work. And, it, and it is, it's good that that's being done before we start the mining. Mm -hmm. You know, because the mining industry, the oil exploration industry... They're on the sea, yeah. Yeah, they didn't really do that. Right. It wasn't regulated, but actually the, the, the deep nodule mining is regulated. So, you know, the oil exploration companies never had to go through the same permitting for drilling right. oil right. as the, the, um, the nodule mining companies. So in a way you could say, We've, we're in a good position because there is there's an international seabed authority that regulates it. Right. So we do have a regulatory authority that at the moment are not allowing mining. So 
actually, there is a process there. And that's like an international treaty? Or, it is. Because right, inter- these are international waters, presumably. It is, that's right. Yeah. And so part of that is that there's... There How do you should... prospect and stake a claim on the, the seafloor, you know, in the middle of the Pacific, I guess? Yeah, so you, you have to go through the Seabed Authority to get a permit. And then with that, you know, if ever mining came off, the countries that are around the... Uh, the claimants all mm-hmm. get a share in the profit. Right, right. So in a way, it's it's a um, it's a better system than we have for terrestrial systems. Right, right. And we have this, you know, they, they they are at the moment there's a moratorium while this work on biodiversity is being done. So uh, it it does remain an option, right. and I'm you know I'm not going to say it's never going to happen, but it is it's a it's a society choice as to whether we feel that the deep ocean should. Is better used. than the yeah yeah. I mean, there's a lot of you know fishing. I mean, the, mm-hmm. we, we depend on the ocean so much for resources. It, you right. know, it's got huge biodiversity, more biodiversity. All types of an- organisms are known in the ocean, right? With as compared to terrestrial systems, so it is a very precious environment, and we have to be so careful with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, if it comes down to sink to decision making, and it, as I say, if we if we're gonna get CO2 out of our, uh, our, our energy system, it may be that we, we might have to turn to the, the sea for mm-hmm. I'm, and I'm, I'm not a proponent particularly of it. I just think we need to make sure that we don't choose something that we, uh, uh, or exclude something based right. on an emotional response rather than a, than a, than a real scientific. Because that, that emotional response is, is very interesting. I could see a lot of environmental groups like Greenpeace saying this is a red line, we're not going to cross it. It, sure. doesn't, it doesn't fit with how we feel about the ocean. But sure. at the same time, you know, I think there's 30,000 large wind turbines being planned for you know, the east uh, continental shelf of the US. Mm. It's in the pathway of the right whales. And it's interesting yep. seeing the environmental movement going from it's all about the whales to, well, kind of bugger off whales who've got to build wind turbines. It's, it's, it's interesting, the kind of politics um, that fit into it's, what we will use the oceans for. It's complicated and it is mm-hmm. a, it's not a simple choice. And I think that one of the problems is we try and make a binary choice about is this good or is, that, right. is, it, is it bad? Right. And you can't say that. You say, well, because the implications of doing that or not doing that means you've got to do it somewhere else. Yeah. So therefore, you have to, let's say, wind turbine off the east coast of Canada. Oh. And you say, oh, I don't want to put it there. Well, where are you going to put those wind turbines? Right. Or you build nuclear plants instead. But Well, yeah, I mean, look, and it's a consideration. Right. Uh, again, I'm not coming out either for or against. Would you, are you pro other sources? Like, would you say you're pro wind or would you just say you're kind of technology neutral? I, I, I'm well, just curious about the nuclear I, angle. I, 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 yeah, the, well, the nuclear side, I think, I, I think it should still be considered. But when you say, I'm just, sorry, not to like press you on this yeah, too hard, yeah. but I'm just curious because a, a lot of people, like my own prime minister say, when asked about nuclear, he'll say, well, you know, we're going to invest in wind and solar mm. and maybe kind of sort of we should keep all options open, keep things on the table. There's a real reluctance to say, yeah, I think nuclear is really like really important. Or I mean, I might go further and say it's a keystone technology. But I guess I'm yeah. curious. I'm kind of pestering you a little bit on that. Like, sure. would you say you're, you're like, would you not say that you're pro wind or pro solar, or would you say as well like those are kind of options on the table? Just well, just to challenge you on that. No, no, exactly. Yeah. Look, up. It, it could, it's 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 horses for courses because if you put if you're let's say. I could be pro wind farm, but right. if it was going to stop the right whale migration, I might be anti it. Right. And a bit like if it was a well-regulated nuclear power station. That, you know, I lived on North Wales in North Wales, and, uh, where there was a nuclear plant for many, many years mm-hmm. that, that never had a, an issue with it. The local people were very supportive. It brought industry. They then built, a, you know, an al- aluminium smelter down the road that brought a lot of jobs in, and it was, you know, net zero. It was. It right. was Net zero energy. aluminum, basically. So right. the aluminium was being produced net zero. The uh, energy in the, the grid, there was there was a, a no negative. Mm-hmm. The only thing is, there's the nuclear waste, and you know we don't know where that that has gone. Mm-hmm. But actually, in that environment, you think well, rather than build, and it would have to have been hundreds of distributed wind turbines. Right. Probably that nuclear power plant there was it was it an option worth considering. So I think I would take it scenario by scenario. Right. Actually, my father worked in the nuclear industry, and, okay. and I, you know, I know that it's, it has, was pretty well regulated. It could be incredibly dangerous, but I would not write it off mm-hmm. as a technology, right. because it, it has been demonstrated in places that it, 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 it can work. So I'm, you know, I'm not completely against nuclear, I'm mm-hmm. not completely against 
wind turbines, and I'm pro doing something that gets carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Right. That's what I'm pro. And, well, and something that will do it yeah. with a, a net positive uh, impact social on, on uh, social and, and, and biodiversity. Because, and that's why it becomes very, very complicated. And we, we need to consider all of those right. options before right. we make the decision. All right. Well, with that uh, last kind of uh, arousing statement in mind, uh, the need to reduce carbon emissions here at COP26, um, Richard Harrington, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. Really well, appreciate you making the time. Thanks very much for inviting me. Absolutely.